Okay, listen up. Now I need you to get your notes out to the very start. And I will let you know when there are new things. Check your new identification sheet because you're going to see like some the new names. Start of the Cuban Missile The start of the whole thing. Way back to day one. And again, I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. But I want everybody to be caught up. This test will be broken up into two days. It's 180 points. So I want you to make sure that you understand what we're doing. Okay? So we're going to start with October 14th and 15th. 1962, setting up the crisis. Now again, if you don't have some of this written down, you probably should. Okay? Again, we said the crisis involved the two most powerful countries in the world, the United States of America and the Soviet Union. It also involved the two most powerful leaders in the world, President Kennedy of the United States and Nikita Khrushchev of the Soviet Union. And on Sunday, October 14, 1962, an American spy plane took photographs of Cuba, which was a normal routine. By Monday, October 15, the photographs were developed and produced shocking results. The photograph clearly showed both missile launching pads being constructed in Cuba and missiles on the ground. These missiles and the ones that were going to be used in the pads, no doubt, got to the Cuba from the Soviet Union. That's basically the 14th and 15th, kind of setting up the crisis. So Tuesday, October 16th, 1962, is the official beginning of 13 days as we speak about. And at 9 o'clock in the morning on that date, President Kennedy called his brother Bobby and asked him to come to the White House. Now I do want to clarify something that I might have misled you a little bit there. Somebody said, do they drive to work? Well, technically they do, but in most instances somebody came and got them and drove them to work, okay? They had people that came and got At 11.45 a.m. in the cabinet room, the CIA gave a formal presentation to President Kennedy and members of the Kennedy cabinet, and the CIA informed the cabinet of the missiles and the missile launching pads in Cuba. And all involved in the discussions believed that the United States was in great danger as a result of this situation <laughs> because Cuba was less than 100 miles from Key West, Florida and any missiles fired from that communist country could reach all major cities in the United States. Now President Kennedy organized a committee to explore options on what to do about the problem in Cuba. The committee was officially called the Executive Committee of the National Security Council. It consisted of cabinet members, military leaders, and other influential government leaders, and the committee became better known as XCOM. I don't think I need to go through all the members of XCOM. I think you probably have those, so we'll skip that part. I do want to re-emphasize the final member of the committee was Kenneth O'Donnell, and because he's going to be so visible in this movie we show you called 13 Days, I want you to know a little bit about him. He was a political advisor to President Kennedy. His official White House position was President and Mrs. Kennedy's appointments secretary. He was a very close friend of Bobby Kennedy. Actually, O'Donnell and President Kennedy met at Harvard University in the fall of 1946 when they both tried out for the football team. In 1952, O'Donnell was recruited to work for John Kennedy during his campaign for the United States Senate. He also became an aide for Senator Kennedy while he was in the Senate, and he followed the Kennedy team to the White House after the election of 1960. Well, later in that day, after a lengthy discussion, this is where I threw you off a little bit. Remember I told you they really had three options? They had three options, but they never talked about three options. The only option that XCOM talked about on that day was bombing the construction sites from the air, followed by invasion. I want you to make sure you understand that. So they did have those three options, but the only option they considered or talked about that particular day was airstrikes followed by invasion. Does everybody understand that? You should note that in your notes. That's the only one they talked about. Now we mentioned to you during the time they were discussing this that Kennedy got some more bad news. The United States Navy had sighted 25 Soviet merchant ships heading towards Cuba. And it was the belief of XCOM that these merchant ships had a high likelihood of carrying missiles to Cuba. So President Kennedy, member was scheduled to, to visit Connecticut the next day on Wednesday, and he wanted to cancel the trip because of the crisis. 
and both Bobby and O'Donnell convinced him to go on as normal as it was crucial that the news of this crisis not get where? To the public. To the, pl to the press. If you wrote that down, I'd put a little star by that. Okay? Put a little star by that. Yes? You think Cuba knew, or, or you, like, Russia knew that we knew like, what well, was going on? No, they really didn't, and we're going to get to that when I get into this a little bit more detail. Okay? So let's keep that question. Okay, we move to Wednesday, October 17th. Remember that I told you before departing for Connecticut, President Kennedy attended a breakfast service at St. Matthew's Cathedral. After other government business and lunch with the Crown Prince of Libya, he boarded Air Force One for Connecticut. After his Connecticut appearance, he returned to Washington, D.C. to resume, resume discussions with XCOM about the crisis in Cuba. Now, this is something that's new I want you to know. During the meeting of XCOM, when the President was gone in Connecticut, this is when Bobby Kennedy discussed some other possible options besides airstrikes. Now, anybody want to know why he was looking at a different option other than airstrikes, other than the inevitable that if we got in a war it would be problems? Why else? Think about what, it, what is an airstrike? Yeah, it is. But what is it when you think about it? We're gonna, are, are we telling them we're coming? No. So it's a sneak attack. And Bobby Kennedy was very concerned, you need to write this down, he was very concerned that a sneak attack by the United States on a much smaller country would be seen as very unpopular around the world. So this is when Bobby Kennedy said, think, fellas think, we're pretty smart here. There's got to be another option other than airstrikes followed by invasion. Because if we airstrike, it's a sneak attack, the world's going to see it as a big you know, the big brother beating the heck out of the little brother. You cannot sneak attack a much smaller country. It would be very unpopular around the world. So this is when he really put pressure on the committee to come up with a second option. And no one would say anything. And finally, Bobby Kennedy looked at Secretary of Defense McNamara and he said, quote, you don't have to write these quotes down, I just want you to listen to them. He said, quote, Bob, if we go ahead with these airstrikes, you know what it'll come to in the end. There's got to be something else. Give it to me. Again, he said, Bob, if we go along, excuse me, if we go ahead with these airstrikes, you know what it'll come to in the end. There's got to be something else. Give it to me. So McNamara said, well, we did do a scenario that was considered six months earlier if this type of thing ever presented itself. We're always thinking ahead about what would we ever do if they put missiles in Cuba. They were thinking about this before this ever happened. And one of the scenarios that they studied six months prior to this was what? Naval blockade. So this is when naval blockade came into this discussion, is when the president was in Connecticut and Bobby Kennedy was looking to a different alternative to airstrikes because he felt airstrikes were a sneak attack and would be perceived very unpopular among other countries in the world. Is everybody okay with that? Mm -hmm. Perfect. We moved to Thursday, October 18th. And <coughs> President Kennedy returned from Connecticut to meet with XCOM. He was given more information from photos taken on recent spy plane missions. And these photos showed a possible 40 missile sightings in Cuba. In other words, they thought there could be as many as 40 missiles on the ground in Cuba. And these actually had a longer range ability than the first missiles they sighted. They would travel farther. And this is where Curtis LeMay, who was the Chief of Staff of the United States Air Force, briefed President Kennedy and gave him his recommendations. And remember, he recommended an immediate airstrike on Cuba. He believed the sites had to be destroyed before they had a chance to become, Sean, operational. operational. And General LeMay's comments to President Kennedy were are as follows. All you got to do is say go, and my boys will get those red bastards. What day was that? That, that was on sh sh Thursday, October 18th. Yeah, yeah. I screwed, that's, change that. That should be Thursday. That hey, he got home Thursday, October 18th. This is some of the communication I have that isn't right. 
Thursday, October 18th. I, get, I was thinking to myself, today I haven't taught this in five years, so i got to make sure it's right. Wait, so what happened on Wednesday? Wednesday was basically the trip to uh, Connecticut and Bobby Kennedy trying to find an alternative to airstrikes. On Thursday, October 18th, the president comes back from Connecticut and meets with XCOM. Thank you, Brandy. Yeah. Now, during the discussion, I'll continue. President Kennedy asked LeMay if he thought it was the only course of action to take, airstrikes. And he said, quote, Mr. President, I believe this is our only course of action. America is in danger. The big red dog is digging in our backyard, and we are justified in shooting him. And he finished by saying this, And sir, given your own statements about Cuba, I think a blockade or bunch of political talk would be considered by a lot of our friends and neutrals as a pretty weak response. I suspect many of our own citizens would feel the same way. You're in a pretty bad fix, Mr. President. And JFK responded and said, What did you say? And after Le LeMay repeated himself, President Kennedy said this, Well, maybe you haven't noticed, you're in it with me. Now, after that heated exchange, Kennedy asked LeMay about Russians, what would Russia's response be if we attacked Cuba? And what did LeMay say? Nothing. And Kennedy looked at him and said, what do you mean nothing? And LeMay's comment was, nothing, because the only alternative open to them is one they can't choose. Now, despite LeMay's comment, this is new, Kennedy said back to him, if we kill Soviet soldiers, they're going to respond. I mean, how would we respond? They are going to do something, General. I can promise you that. Now, again, what was he thinking? They, where would their response be? Berlin. Berlin. Very good. Now, remember, this is when Kennedy listened to the military's recommendations, thanked them, and dismissed himself into his office where he met with Bobby and Kenneth O'Donnell. Now, what was the reaction of the military and former Secretary of State Atchison when they did that? Very angry. They could not believe they did not get the go-ahead for the airstrikes. Okay? Well, late that same afternoon of the 18th, who did Kennedy meet with? Uh, Andre Gromyko. And remember, he was a Soviet diplomat. And what did Gromyko tell Kennedy during that meeting? That they would stop threatening Cuba. That they could quit threatening. Gromyko suggested that the United States should stop threatening Cuba. Gromyko further stated that the Soviet Union was only supplying Cuba with what type of assistance? Agricultural. Agricultural. Very good. And he went on to emphasize that the Soviet Union would never become involved in furnishing any offensive weapons to Cuba. And Kennedy kept a straight face, knowing he was lying straight to his face, and warned him again of the profound effect it would have on the United States if they were to put any offensive weapons in Cuba. And that's when Gromyko again assured President saying that the sole objective of the USSR would is give bread to Cuba in order to prevent hungry hunger in that country. And Kennedy again asked him one more time, there's no misunderstanding here, correct? You would never put missiles in Cuba, and he said no, said goodbye, and left the office. So he officially denied that there were any missiles in Cuba at that time. And again, the president was quite upset because he believed he had purposely lied to his face. And this is some maybe new material. He then talked with Bobby and O'Donnell and he insisted Bobby get a consensus on either a blockade or airstrikes because they were split down the middle. Why did Kennedy want a consensus? Why did he want a consensus from XCOM? Not wishy-washy, a consensus. Why do you want that? Why do you want Bobby to push? Either get him in favor of a blockade or get him in favor of airstrikes. One or the other. I can't have a I can't have him going back and forth. Why? So that it could happen. So it would be decisive and we wouldn't look weak, like we can't make a decision. Now, where was President Kim? Okay, we move on now to Friday the 19th. Do you have that in your notes? Friday. We're moving to Friday the 19th. And where was Kennedy supposed to go? Oh, okay. so let's go to Chicago. And he was thinking of canceling again. And both O'Donnell and Bobby kind of gave him a bad time about that. Why? Do you remember? Richard Daly. Huh? Because he would have to cancel on Mayor Richard Daly, who his organization helped Kennedy get 
elected in 1960 with the help of his father. And they were teasing Jack Kennedy that he was afraid to cancel on daily. He goes, I'm not afraid to cancel on daily. I'll go do it right now. Well, the next thing you know, where is he at? In Chicago. He didn't want to do it either. So the president was scheduled for a campaign trip to Chicago. He thought of canceling. Mayor Richard Daly was expecting the president. And because of the help given to him by the Daly family in the election of 1960, JFK ended up going. Now, during this trip, Bobby called and visited with O'Donnell, stating that he had what he thought was a consensus among XCOM for what? A blockade. But it was only going to last how long? Just pretty much that day or a day. And so what did Bobby Kennedy need for O'Donnell to do? Get his brother back because he didn't think the vote would last. And so what did O'Donnell do to get him back? Made up a story that the president had a cold and he informed President Secretary Salinger that the president had developed a cold and he needed to return to his doctor in D.C. And Salinger in frustration said, quote, Kenny, do I get any input around here? And O'Donnell's response was, yeah, how bad it is, is up to you. You can decide how bad the cold was. So the point being on that is they didn't even keep Press Secretary Salinger in the loop on this because they didn't want any leaks to the press. That was important. So Salinger announced to the press that the president would be canceling the rest of his visit and returning to Washington, D.C. on the advice of his doctor. Okay? So now we move to Saturday, October 20th. So make sure that's where you're at in your notes. Now, we told you this before, but we kind of had it in the wrong spot. After his return from Chicago, President Kennedy met with XCOM and studied his options. And after the committee talked some more, they recommended a blockade, a blockage of all ships into Cuba. Now this is when, this is important you know this, this is when Defense Secretary McNamara made it clear that we were going to call this a quarantine instead of a blockade. And he said that in the XCOM meeting. We can't call this a blockade, we'll call it a quarantine. Because a blockade would be seen as an act of war, and a quarantine would not. So that's where the decision was made to refer to this from this point on as a quarantine, not a blockade. And that's something that Defense Secretary McNamara made real clear to XCOM. Um, McNamara reported also that 20 to 30 Soviet ships were en route to Cuba. And he, he said, so, the, so everybody's wondering, well, what's our plan here? What's going to happen here? What are we going to do? Okay, we're going to put this quarantine out, and how's it going to work? Now, I'm not talking about the rules of engagement. The rules of engagement would be what would happen if they don't follow this plan, I'm going to tell you. But here's what's the plan. When the ships were 800 miles away from the quarantine line, the United States Navy was supposed to stop any Soviet ship at the 800 mile radius. Okay? They would then board the ship, inspect the ship, and if the vessel was carrying weapons, they would be ordered back. Okay? That was the plan. At 800 miles out, the U.S. Navy would stop the Soviet ship, they would board the ship, they would inspect the ship, and if the ship was carrying weapons, they would be turned back. If they weren't carrying weapons, what would happen? They'd allow them to go. Now, you think about this quarantine. Is it, what, it's going to solve one of two problems. What's the problem it's going to solve? No more missiles coming in to Cuba. What is it not going to solve? The ones that are there. And the hope at this point, it's important you know this, the hope at this point on Saturday the 20th is that if we stop these missiles, inspect and, or stop these ships, inspect them and send them back, that the Soviet Union will get the hint and what would they do with the missiles that are already in Cuba that pull them out to kind of save face and prevent war. So the initial plan with the quarantine, I want to emphasize again, was to stop any Soviet ship at the 800 mile radius of the quarantine line, board them, inspect them, if they're carrying missiles, send them back, that's it. If they're not carrying missiles, let them go. This was going to keep any more missiles from getting into Cuba. To solve the problems of getting the Cuban missiles, or the Soviet missiles out that were already there, they thought this procedure 
might have the Soviet Union thinking, well, we don't really want to start a war here, and so what we'll do is we'll just graciously remove the missiles on our own. That was the hope. We're going to find out that doesn't work. Now, if the Soviets refused to remove the missiles, we still would have the option of airstrikes, correct? In other words, we're not sneak attacking them, okay, because we've offered to get them to stop at the quarantine line or 800 miles out. If they're cooperative, everything's fine. If they're not cooperative, we still have our option of air attacks, okay? And then it doesn't get viewed as a sneak attack because we told you so back there to get the missiles out, okay? Now, CIA Director John McCone was still against the blockade. They had a consensus, but he was still against the blockade. He was still pushing for airstrikes. Why do you think he would be concerned about the block blockade? Think about it. Why would he think about it? Now think about that, and it's, it's, it's a little bit difficult, but I want you to try to think. Why would McCone still be against the blockade? What, do, what two things might happen if we blockade instead of airstrike? That's a great. He was afraid they were going to have a use them or lose them philosophy, and they would launch the missiles because they it's in fear they would lose them. That's very good. The second thing he thought is if we've warned them, if we're not doing the sneak attack, what have we lost? Our first strike capability. What does that mean? Surprise attack. They know we're coming, and they're going to be better defended if they know we're coming. So McCone was really still against the blockade because A, he said, hey, we're going to lose our first strike capability. The element of surprise will be gone. And then he was concerned about the risk that if the Soviet knew, Union knew in advance that we knew they had missiles in there and we were doing it this way, that they would have the use them or lose them philosophy and they would launch. Okay? Now, at this point, Adlai Stevenson, God bless his heart, he spoke up and said this. Now tell me what you get out of this. He said... Maybe one of us in this room should be a coward, so I guess it will be me. This is what Adlai Stevenson said. They're still talking blockade versus airstrikes, and Adlai Stevenson says, maybe one of us in this room should be a coward, so I guess it'll be me. What's he suggesting? What's he going to be suggesting that would look cowardly, possibly? Do nothing. No? No, the sheep's milk. That... Not the airstrike. Not the airstrike, right? So the not the, the blockade. Not the blockade. Negotiate. Yeah. And what he's saying, I want you to kind of write this down. Think about it. Here's what he said. Now just listen first. He said we do have another option. We can strike a deal with the Soviets, trading Guantanamo and our missiles in Turkey in exchange for the Soviets removing their missiles from Cuba. So Stevenson, nobody wants to say it. They all think it, but nobody wants to be the coward. So Stevenson says, I'll be the coward. There is a third option. Let's negotiate. Okay? Let's strike a deal. Let's tell the Soviets that we will... What, now, think, think about that. I want you to think about this one because it's still going on today. Okay? Trade Guantanamo and our missiles in Turkey for them removing the missiles in Cuba. What does trading Guantanamo mean? Yeah, Guantanamo, Bay. Guantanamo Bay is in Cuba, and there's pris prisoners of war there, military prisoners of war, and that's been controversial for years, and is still controversial today. And so he was going to trade Guantanamo, get rid of that military prison in Guantanamo Bay, Cuba, and also take our missiles out of Turkey in exchange. Everybody looked at him like he was nuts. But they all thought the same thing. And President Kennedy respectfully stated to Stevenson that that was not possible. And this is when he made it public to XCOM that he would make his decision public when? Monday, Monday. Monday night during his television speech. So it was at this point when Kennedy told, respectfully told Adlai Stevenson, Adlai, I don't see that as possible. And he informed the committee, I'll make my decision Monday night on national television. So this is when he asked Ted Sorensen, and his speechwriter, to prepare two speeches. One for a speech explaining the use of naval blockade, and one speech explaining airstrikes followed by invasion. 
Okay, you guys, on this, I'm feeling better you're getting it anyway. Mm, but the, the missiles in two hours, they were real. Oh, yeah, they were. We'll talk about that. Okay, the, the president... We, we, we they were never, they were useless. They weren't. No, we'll tell you that when we get to the end. Okay, the president concluded this meeting, thanked the committee for their advice, and moved on. Now, here's new information. I want you to get this for sure. Okay? That evening, there was a dinner party. Is this on Monday? What's that? No, this, yeah, this is, no, this is still Sunday night. This is crucial. There was a dinner party Sunday night. Okay? And Adlai Stevenson started visiting with Kenneth O'Donnell. And Adlai said, do you see anybody cut their political throat as bad as I did today in the meeting? And Kenneth O'Donnell really didn't know what to say. And Stevenson said to O'Donnell, he says, the Washington Times has the story of what's going on in Cuba. And they're going to print it tomorrow morning about troop movements in Florida, rumors of an invasion of Cuba. This press sniffs out everything. And they kept it as quiet as they could. But Adlai Stevenson's sources told him that the Washington Times was going to print a story Monday morning about troop movements in Florida and the United States possibly invading Cuba. Who does that panic? Well, right away, O'Donnell calls Kennedy and says, holy smokes, we're not going to be able to make it till tomorrow night. They're printing this tomorrow morning. And Kennedy wanted nothing out to the American people before his speech. So what do you think he had to do? What did Kennedy do? He called the publisher of the Washington Times, a guy by the name of Orville Dreyfus, which is on your sheet, your new sheet. He called Orville Dreyfus late that night and said, you've got to hold this story. If you hold this story, or don't hold this story, and this comes out tomorrow, we are sunk. And he, he hesitated. He says, he says, I hesitate on the Bay of Pigs, and I live to regret it the rest of my life. In other words, he had some information on the Bay of Pigs that he didn't release, that if he would have released would have been deemed quite a journalist, you know what I mean? And he, he said, I hesitate on that, I can't hesitate on this. And President Kennedy's response, said, and he says, what am I going to tell my reporters that have worked so hard on this story? And Kennedy's response was, quote, tell them they'll be saving lives, including their own. Because Kennedy believed that this got out and screwed up the point where the, Ru the Russians and, and Cubans knew we were doing these things, that it that could lead to no cure holocaust in which many people would lose their lives. So I'll be darned if Kennedy didn't have enough pull that he convinced Dreyfus not to run that story until Tuesday morning, which was very crucial. So everybody got that down, kind of understand that? Okay, we'll move on then to Sunday, October 21st. You should be there in your notes, correct? Sunday, October 21st. And Saturday night. No, I'm sorry, Saturday night, my fault. God. Saturday night. Saturday night. So they held that story two days, folks, which was difficult. No, I got my days mixed up. Saturday night was the dinner party. So now we're going to the 21st? Now we're going to the 21st, yep. Do I have you totally confused? Yeah. No, not bad. Okay, a lot of stuff happened on Saturday. Sunday, remember, Sunday was the day, Sunday was the day that not much happened. What happened Sunday in your notes? Mass. Okay, he went to Mass at St. Stephen's Church with Mrs. Kennedy. He met with General Walker Sweeney and asked if the airstrikes could guarantee destruction of all the missiles in Cuba. And Sweeney told him what? No. no. Now, here's some new information on this. I didn't know until I did a little more research. After Sweeney said he couldn't guarantee destruction of 100% of the missiles, LeMay stepped out, because he was at the meeting also, and he said, but we can get 90% of them. We can get 90% of them. Well, Kennedy listened to that, and then he told the military to put the United States Armed Forces on DEFCON 3 at 7 p.m. Monday night. Now listen, that's important. On Sunday, after listening to these guys talk and talk and talk about airstrikes and can't do this and can't do that, 
He informed the military, and who would he inf who would he have informed personally? Who is the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff at this point? General. General, General Maxwell. Maxwell Taylor. Kennedy tells General Maxwell Taylor on Sunday that he will put the United States Armed Forces on DEF, D E F C O N, DEF CON 3 at 7 o'clock Monday night, which is ironically the same time of what starts his speech. Now, you don't have to write this down, but let me tell you, let me tell you about this. DEF CON 3 means that we have an increase in force readiness above normal readiness. Okay, DEF CON 2, further increase in force readiness, but less than maximum readiness. And DEF CON 1, maximum force readiness, or we're going to war. So there's five of them. DEF CON 5 is normal peacetime readiness, what we're on right now. DEF CON 4, normal increased intelligence and strength and security measures. That's four, and we went to three, which is an increase in force readiness above normal readiness. So they're a little bit more prepared than normal. Okay? Now, that's Sunday. We're at five now. Five is normal peacetime readiness. Okay. okay. Now, if we get involved in any more stuff in Syria, you never know. But anyway. What's Syria? Zero. Oh, there is no zero. Zero is see you later or history. They're trying to, we're in a Cuban Missile Crisis this whole time, they're trying to avoid zero. Okay? All right. We move on to Monday. Monday. On Monday morning, who did President Kennedy call right away in the morning? His brother? Uh, he called President, former Presidents Hoover, Truman, and Eisenhower to brief him on the situation. Then he wrote a letter to Premier Khrushchev. Shh. And in the letter it stated, I have not assumed that you or any other sane man would in this nuclear age deliberately plunge the world into war which it is crystal clear no country could win and which only a result in catastrophic consequences to the world, to, excuse me, to the whole world. And this is when Pierre Sounger announced to the press, quote, that President Kennedy will address the nation tonight on radio and television on a subject of the highest national security. Now, prior to his speech that evening, I gave you four things that Kennedy did. Do you remember what they were? Ordered the Navy to begin the blockade of Cuba? Not yet. He drew a line in the sand, so to speak, in the ocean of how far he would let the Soviet ships Advance towards Cuba? No. Okay. no. If a ship crossed that line, it'd be shot. He made it clear to military personnel that if a merchant ship crossed the point entering American waters, they would be attacked. Now, put in parentheses by this. Listen. Number three, he informed military personnel. Better write this down, Sean. He informed military personnel that if the merchant ships crossed this point, entering American waters, the ships would be attacked. That is called the rules of engagement. And we'll talk about what the rules of engagement were. Per rules of engagement. We have rules of engagement before we attack any enemy vessel, ship, etc. So he's basically telling them if they, any of those merchant ships cross the point, we will follow our rules of engagement, which I'll talk about later. And he also made it clear that war would be declared by the United States upon the Soviet Union if they ignored the quarantine line. So now, Augie, what happened at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time that same night? He met with Congress about his decision. And what was he looking for from Congress? Uh, support, but he and, didn't get it. And he didn't get any. He was very upset about that. What happened at 6 o'clock then that night, Carly? The Secretary of State tells Russian Ambassador about the contents of the speech. Yeah, on Anatoly Dobrynin of the contents of the president's speech. And what happens at 7 o'clock, Annie? Kennedy addresses the nation concerning the Cuban, the Cuban Right, and he tells them five things. He tells them, number one, the missile construction sites. He tells them about the missile construction sites in Cuba. He tells them that there are already missiles in Cuba. He tells them that the Soviet Union were denying that there are any construction sites or missiles in Cuba. He also announced his decision to enact a naval blockade. 
and he also told the American people the seriousness of his, a of his actions if Cuba made the decision to launch any missiles against the United States. Because he said in his speech, it shall be the policy of this nation to regard any nuclear missile launched from Cuba against any nation in the Western Hemisphere as an attack by the Soviet Union on the United States requiring a full retaliatory response upon the Soviet Union. So what's he saying? We're going to send them back. Yeah. Okay, so that's where we ended, right? Yes. All right, perfect. So now we'll move to Tuesday, October 23rd. Right, and we'll get a little start on this. What? Take a break. No. Okay, we're not going to go too far, but I want to get started on Tuesday. Okay. On Tuesday morning, October 23rd, the day after the President's speech, XCOM again met. And the President voiced his greatest concern, and that was, what exact action is the Navy going to take if the Soviet ships refuse our ultimatum? Where are we going? Those procedures that we're going to be using now, if they do not cooperate, are called the rules of engagement. So, Bobby Kennedy took over the discussion. He asked Admiral George W. Anderson Jr., who's a new guy on your sheet. Bobby asked Admiral George W. Anderson Jr., what our rules of engagement would be if the Soviet ships do not cooperate. What procedures are we going to take? What are we going to do? What are our rules of engagement? Here are the rules of engagement. Number one, first thing we would do if they do not cooperate is the Navy would attempt to make radio contact with approaching ships radio contact. What are they going to have to do for that to make sense? We're going to have to have sailors that speak Russian. So the Navy would attempt to make radio contact with approaching Soviet, Soviet ships using American sailors fluent in Russian. Secondly, once we made that radio contact, the Soviet ships would be ordered to reduce speed and stand by for inspection. The ships would be ordered to reduce speed and stand by for inspection. So we would attempt to make radio contact with them. Once we did, they would be ordered to reduce speed and stand by for inspection. Once they reduced speed and stood by, a Navy inspection team number three would board the vessel and search it for what? Missiles. Weapons or missiles. Yep. So the third step of the rules of engagement is the Navy inspection team would board the ship and search the vessel for any offensive weapons. So obviously the fourth step would be if the vessel contained offensive weapons, they would be ordered to turn around and go home out of the quarantine area. Now you think about it, we're not being really uh, violent about this. We're not asking for the missiles. We're not demanding they turn over the missiles or weapons. We're simply telling them they have to turn around. So those are the rules of engagement, if everything goes correctly. So what do you think Bobby's next question to Admiral Anderson would be? What if they refuse to be searched? What if they refuse to be searched? Here's the number one rule of engagement if that happened. If the Soviet ship refused to be searched, it would be towed into the nearest port. If the Soviet ship refused to be searched, it would be towed into the nearest port. What? It'd be an American friendly port, obviously. Yeah. But what if it was like our port and then they like. I, don't know. I think we're getting ahead of it. But anyway, what would be Bobby's next question then? What if they refuse to be towed? Very good. These are good questions. Here's the rules of engagement if the Soviet ships refused to be towed or in, in other minds refused to stop, refused to slow down, 
or ran the blockade. Any of those things, okay? Worst case scenarios. The first rule of engagement in that case is the Navy would shoot a warning shot across the bow of the ship. They would shoot a warning shot across the bow. Where's that? Right across the top, front end of it. Right over the top. So it wouldn't hit it? No. Warning shot across the bow. <laughs> Number two, if the ship ignored the warning shot, the Navy would then fire at the Soviet ship's rudder, disabling the ship, and they would carry on with their inspection anyway. So if they tried to run the blockade, wouldn't be towed, uh, wouldn't slow down, any of those things, the first rule of engagement to that was shooting a warning shot across the bow, and the second would be they would fire at the ship's rudder, disable the ship, and carry on with the inspection. When President Kennedy heard that, what was his first reaction? Did he disagree with those? No. no, but what did he want? Think about it. No. If a, he wanted that, you're leading to it. What? Oh, who is he going to want to make that decision whether any Soviet ships are fired upon? Yeah. Himself. So he told Admiral Anderson, made it very clear there would be no firing on any ships in the quarantine zone without his explicit permission. So they only could follow the rules of engagement if what? Kennedy if Kennedy gave him the go-ahead. That's crucial that you remember that. Does anybody have any questions over anything we covered today? I appreciate your cooperation. I wanted to get you some more information. I had some things happen during dates I want to change. Now, we, now listen up. The stuff we covered today that I started from start to right now, there are 20 short answer questions in that material that I just gave you. Awesome. Okay? And we'll continue on tomorrow. This test will consist of matching one day short answer questions the next. What's the test going to be? Probably not for a week. Okay. Okay, very good job, kids. Very nice job. Yes. Mr. Durr, are you yeah. doing video tomorrow? Yes. What time is the volleyball? Nine. 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 N